Thank you, Darren. Um, so we, we heard from my colleague Carla this morning, who presented a historical narrative that reminded us the role that sound public policy, social innovation, and innovative technologies have played time and time again to help us cope with crisis. As we move forward, we need to recognize these trends. We need to know that we have these strengths within us, and these will help us cope with crisis in the future. However, as we move forward, we're not going to be only coping with crisis. We want to move further than that and build a sustainable future. A sustainable future that we think is defined by a vibrant economy, a vibrant natural environment, and, and a social system. So what are some of these principles? You've heard, of, you've heard many of these mentioned in some of the speeches earlier this morning, and I definitely saw them come up again and again in our, at our table discussions. The first element that we, that we think is important for a sustainable future is a systems approach. A systems approach is simply a management approach that looks, looks at systems as a whole. Um, it does this by integrating, say, land and water management, or it might do this by integrating agriculture and drinking water supply. The intent, one of the key intents of a systems approach is to maximize multiple benefits. The next key principle that we've, uh, we've located is enabling policies. Enabling policies are policies that enable innovation and flexibility within them. They don't just focus on what you ought not to do, but provide incentives for systemic change. Strategic investments are investments made into identified um, assets and opportunities. For example, later this afternoon, you'll hear a lot about the bioeconomy as an emerging opportunity. By investing strategically in something like the bioeconomy, we can, we, can, we can be ahead of the curve. Communications and outreach are critical for the success of any future vision and its implementation. And by communications and outreach, we mean not just informing and including stakeholders, but working to, towards a, a, a truly collaborative approach. And finally, innovative technology. Um, and as, as some people mentioned here, innovative technologies are not just high-end new technologies. These may include technologies that are time-tested, well-developed, but are used in new and innovative ways at a, at a number of different levels, so from you know, the grassroots level to industry. I use a series of international and regional practices to demonstrate how these principles have been used. Our first example is of the European Water Framework Directive. Um, this is a piece of legislation that was passed in Europe in the year 2000 and aims simply for good water status in all European waters by the year 2015. Um, what you see here are the many river basins in Europe. Uh, this directive uses the river basin as a management unit and in doing so uh, enables integration of not only land and water but also integration across na international boundaries. By selecting river basins as the appropriate management framework, it also enables sectoral integration. So what you see here, for example, industry and agriculture and drinking water are brought together to talk to each other and develop a river basin management plan that can work for everyone. The Water Framework Directive also demonstrates what an enabling policy can look like. By developing high-level targets and timelines, it allows the European nations um, within these river basins to develop their own mechanisms to reach these timelines and targets. It also enables collaboration. Again, by, by using the river basin as an appropriate framework, it allows for not only international jurisdictions, but also sectoral people. This, this is actually from one of their communications pieces, so I had to put it in there. Our next example, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, our next example is of Singapore. Um, Singapore decided to develop a national water program when it faced some severe water shortages and water quality issues in the 1960s and 70s. It developed its national water program based on what it called its four national taps that you see here. Seawater, new water, which I'll go into in a minute, imported water, and rainwater. So by, by applying this multi-pronged approach, I was hesitating to use that word till Premier Salinger used it today. Uh, by using this multi-pronged approach, they, they show this kind of systems thinking and, and integrated approach to their whole water management program. Their rainwater management program in itself shows a systems approach. Um, by using their entire landmass as a catchment, they maximize rainfall capture on the island with a network of drains and reservoirs that, that serve the purpose of storing as well as managing clean water. This particular example is also a really good example of 
education and outreach, of, of communications and outreach. The same systems of canals and reservoirs that Singapore has used to maximize its rainwater catchment is used for waterfront activities, for water recreation, as well as for educational messaging. The photograph on the left is an example of how they've used the Marina Barrage, one of their prominent reservoirs, as a means to communicate to the public the value of water and the value of water um, conservation. This, this particular facility, again, serves a multi-fold purpose. It, it provides, you know, storage, flood control, lifestyle attraction, and educational messaging. Another great example of their use of effective communications and outreach is through their new water program. Now, new water is, their, is Singapore's word for recycled waste and sewage water, which incidentally they call used water. They never call it waste or sewage water. So they've used this kind of wording to communicate to the public that new water or recycled water can, can be a viable source of water. So much so that Singapore is using about 30% of its water supply is now new water. And uh, at IIST, we've actually been so impressed with this uh, technology that we've, been, we've worked with Singapore and brought in a small unit to be used at our office. And you'll be happy to know that all the water you're drinking here is actually recycled sewage water. So <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Sorry. We're not there yet. Our next case, just wanted to check if everyone was listening. Um, our next case is Israel, which has um, emerged from many years of water shortages to come up as a world leader in water technology. As many of you will know, Israel is one of, in one of the most arid regions of the world and has, over the last 70 years, developed its, its water technology sector to, be, to export this expertise around the world. They've, they've worked with technology around desalination, irrigation, and wastewater treatment, amongst many others. Recognizing its own strength in water technology development, Israel has strategically invested in this sector to create Watec, which is, its, which is its, essentially its venture center. This, this center works with its own companies and utility uh, providers and uh, provides beta testing facilities, provides R&D mechanisms, provides marketing opportunities, to, to develop this sector even more and provide this expertise elsewhere in the world. In fact, Manitoba has, has recently signed an agriculture and water research agreement with Israel and has, has developed a fairly close working relationship with them. Another great example of investing strategically in strengths is given to us by South Korea. Now, this example doesn't have anything directly to do with water, but what it does is shows us how South Korea time and time again has used strategic investment to build on their strengths and get them out of fairly difficult situations. The first of these examples is back in the late 1990s after the Asian stock market collapse, South Korea looked inwards, looked at its own strengths, and decided to invest strategically in information and communications technology. By investing close to $25 billion in its ICC, ICT sector, um, it resulted in an astounding increase in IT market servers and broadband speeds and access. What you see on your right is Korea is second from the top. It's compared to, say, Canada, which is fifth from the bottom in broadband speed in OECD countries. Another example of this is um, in last year's economic, uh, worldwide economic collapse, m many countries developed stimulus packages to help their own economies. Um, South Korea did the same thing, but its, its stimulus package looked quite different from other countries. It decided to use 81% of its stimulus package as green uh, technology investments. This includes um, initiatives for green buildings and homes, low carbon technologies, clean transport and biofuels production. Incidentally, a part of this investment is also made into the renewal of rivers for drought proofing, which is just interesting given this forum. But, um, as, as uh, we saw in Israel's case, South Korea is also exporting this expertise. The, the province of Ontario earlier this year has signed an agreement with South Korea to, to get this expertise and help them develop um, a clean technology manufacturing industry, which will help Ontario develop up to 16,000 jobs um, and also help in achieving its goal of phasing out all coal-powered plants by the year 2014. So these were some of our examples from around the world. But what about right here in our backyard? We have a bunch of small examples that provide 
proof of concept on, on, a, on a small scale. And we believe that if some of these initiatives are replicated and scaled up, we can work towards, we can build these towards a sustainable future for our watershed. The first of these that we, we talk about is South Tobacco Creek. South Tobacco Creek demonstrates a watershed-based whole systems approach that maximizes multiple benefits. Since 1985, a group of farmers called the Deerwood Soil and Water Management Association has been working together to develop land and, man land and water management practices. They've also been working with key scientific uh, partners to monitor the impact of these actions on the watershed. This, this particular example gives us a model of, of identifying, of addressing management challenges at the community level. They use innovative technology. This is to say that they use technologies that are that are known to us. They use small dams in new and innovative ways and at the community level to at attain these multiple benefits. These dams stabilize production, improve resilience to floods and droughts, and also help manage the flow of nutrients. The rural municipality of Dufferin gives us an example of an enabling policy. Since earlier this year, the rural municipality has been giving landowners an incentive of $40 an acre for wetlands restored. While we've seen this example across the province a number of times, uh, this, the RM taking the leadership in this is showing um, a policy that can enable a policy goal. The RM believes that restored wetlands can reduce damage to, to infrastructure from flooding and will save them money in the long term by, by reducing the amount of money they'll have to spend on restoring infrastructure post-flooding. This example also demonstrates strategic investment. The restored wetlands will reduce uh, their spending on post-flooding damage, but also help provide a host of other benefits. Again, drought proofing, nutrient loading uh, reduction, and so on. You've heard about this example today. Uh, the Netley Libo Marsh is, again, a great example of a systems approach by um, by managing this marsh as a system, this is a, this is a, for those of you who don't know, this is a large coastal wetlands at the mouth of the Red River, essentially the last stop before the Red River flows into Lake Winnipeg. Uh, research on this marsh is being conducted, led by our colleague Richard Grossens at Amongst You, and uh, in conjunction with partners from the University of Manitoba. And this wetland, if managed properly, as shown by other wetlands as well, this wetland, if managed properly, can provide a range of benefits. These can be public and private benefits and include nutrient management, reducing the effects of droughts, um, controlling erosion, recharging groundwater, and so on. This example also shows how innovative technology can be used to develop new market opportunities or new value chains. Um, as I believe uh, Hank mentioned and others have mentioned, harnessing the cattails from this, from this marsh, using it to, to pelletizing it for fuel, producing bioenergy from it, and potentially even using the ash precipitate to recover some of the phosphorus and feed it back into the land as fertilizer shows one example of a, of a value chain that, that can be created by managing a wetland in, its, in an innovative way. A similar piece of innovative technology research go, is going on currently at the University of Manitoba in partnership with Genome Canada and Genome Prairie. This research is looking at microbial processes that will convert second generation feedstock into um, biofuels and biomaterials. By, by focusing on second generation feedstock, it takes away the, the, the pressure that first generation feedstocks have had on food supply, for example. It also builds on Manitoba's strengths of a high uh, land base, high agricultural productivity. This, this example is better known to um, many people in this, in this province as being re recently featured in national and um, regional media as the same researchers who are working on converting discarded Tim Hortons cups into, into biofuels. And this is an example of how communications can be used to make research that's fairly theoretical and complex into something that's more understandable and palatable to a larger stakeholder group. So to summarize, I used a number of international and regional case studies to demonstrate the principles that we've, we've built upon and taken to our vision of a, of a sustainable future. 
These are the principles that have inspired us and helped us build our vision. We're hoping that this will just seed your thinking around what other principles might be included in that sustainable future. We believe that these principles and others like them, if used appropriately and managed appropriately, can give us a sustainable and viable future. Thank you. <laughs>